Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. I am Claire Davison. I'm an engagement officer in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us for Book Club. Today we will discuss Wolf Hall uh, by Hilary Mantle, selected, which the, the title was selected by Department of English Leaders and Faculty. Uh, so we are recording this webinar, um, and uh, we will share this video along with some additional resources um, with all of you uh, via email after the event. Uh, attendees, you are muted and your video is off. Um, if you have a comment or question to add to the conversation, you can share by typing or by speaking. Uh, so if you'd like to type, click Q&A at the bottom of your screen, uh, and then you can submit your comment or question. Um, and if you would like to speak, click raise hand. Uh, and then I will um, enable your audio. You'll see a little pop-up to unmute yourself. Uh, and then uh, you'll be able to, to share your comment with our panel. Um, so we already have about 30 folks on this webinar, so we may not be able to respond to every comment and question, but we will do our best to address as many as possible. Um, uh, so a, a, a huge, huge thank you to Hannibal Hamlin, a professor in the Department of English for sharing his expertise with us today. Uh, Hannibal will get us started with some opening remarks about, about Wolf Hall, excuse me, and then we'll open up the conversation to all of your questions and comments. So Hannibal, take it away. Thanks, Clara. I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, and, and happy to um, join the discussion. And I hope I've got a few interesting things to, to offer. Uh, and then I look forward to hearing um, all the questions that you all have. I thought I'd start out, I mean, I don't have a, anything like a lecture on this, but I thought I'd start out by addressing a couple of um, big questions that came into Clara bef um, at least earlier in the week. And they're actually the questions that occurred most to me when I was thinking about this. Um, and they, they're questions that, I mean, I, by no means I'm offering, am I offering sort of like complete answers. And so they're things that we can certainly continue to talk about, but they might generate some more ideas. The first has to do with history. Um, uh, this is a historical novel. It's based on uh, a historical period that actually is extremely popular um, uh, for historical fiction for one reason or another. That in itself is an interesting question. Why is it that the story of the Tudors in the 16th century has generated so many novels and television series and films and plays uh, and continues to? Um, but the history itself, uh, just to address a little bit of that, um, it's well documented. Uh, there, it's a very active field for historians. Um, but there are some controversial issues. Uh, this is the nature of history. It's not as if there is a single history that everybody agrees on that one can go to. Very often, especially for periods like this that are complicated, um, you have historical debates. Um, the historical term for this is historiography, the sort of um, the record of various historical arguments put together. Um, and <sighs> the pendulum may swing one way or another as, as to um, which of these is more persuasive, but it's seldom the case that you suddenly sort of settle on things. So for instance, our central character, Thomas Cromwell, um, is a figure of great controversy. He is, uh, he, traditionally, he's been seen as really a dark figure. Um, Stephen Greenblatt, the uh, famous American Shakespearean scholar, likened him to um, Berea, the head of Stalin's secret police, um, which may be a little harsh, but um, he does have that sort of reputation, the sort of strong man behind the scenes, the hatchet man for Henry VIII, uh, who's himself got plenty of darkness. And obviously, um, Hilary Mantel is pushing back against that to some uh, significant degree. Another controversial figure involved in all of this is Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife, Henry's famous for having six wives. What is it? Divorced, beheaded, uh, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Um, Anne Boleyn is the second one, uh, the first to be beheaded. And part of the controversy about her has to do with, um, well, how she's represented. Um, is, she an, is she a relative innocent in all of this, uh, a victim, another victim of Henry's um, terror, or is she in some sense partly at least responsible for her own fate? Um, obviously, the charges against her seem alarming. Well, they're, they're, it's hard not to believe that they're somewhat trumped up, uh, especially the bit about witchcraft. And we may be a little skeptical, too, about the charge of incest. 
But it's not impossible that, um, that the charges of adultery have some legitimacy, legitimacy, especially if you think about the nature of the Tudor court, about Anne's growing up in France, about the nature of Henry himself at this point. Um, whether that affects our position on, on her one way or another is, is another question. And the other, another figure who's very much involved in the controversial debates about history in this period is Thomas More. Actually, More is, Thomas More is probably the most controversial figure in Hilary Mantel's novels. Um, he dies, of course, at the very end of, <laughs> spoiler alert, I hope everybody's finished, uh, at the end of Wolf Hall, she goes on to write two more novels, but, but more is the sort of climactic of his death, his execution is the climax of this novel. For Catholics, more is a saint. Um, we actually have a More house on campus, um, and, and Thomas More is a Catholic saint. He's revered um, as, uh, in all ways, as, as heroic. And in fact, his execution is seen as a kind of martyrdom, uh, resisting the, the radical, heretical uh, moves of Henry and his churchmen and Cromwell, who supports him, and going to the block um, on an issue of, um, of essentially the, the highest matter, salvation history, maintaining the authority of God and church um, over that of the king. Um, because Hilary Mantel sort of shifts the, the moral valences somewhat, um, giving us a much more interesting and positive Cromwell, though we can talk about that, and a much darker, more suspect Thomas More, there's been a lot of backlash, especially from, um, from Catholic scholars and readers, um, the historian Eamon Duffy, who's a major a Catholic historian in the period, has written about this. And there are a number of articles in, in Catholic journals. Um, even it's, it's interesting, you know, that you, you might think this is something confined to the 16th century, but people still bandy about words like heresy and blasphemy, um, you know, accusing Hilary Mantel of, of the same kinds of things they would accuse Cromwell and Henry VIII of. Um, that, that, you know, to, so that the misrepresentation of Thomas More in this novel is not just a historical error or a sign of bias, um, but in fact, uh, supporting a heretical position, which is <laughs> a little startling. Um, one of the key questions in terms of the representation of More has to do with his, um, uh, I, think, I think Mantel pretty clearly um, argues that Moore is himself guilty of torturing heretics. Uh, and Eamon Duffy certainly, who is an eminent historian, argues that there's just not evidence for that. Um, and he's not the only one. There, there are Protestant historians and those who aren't, don't have a confessional bias who make the same arguments, that, that the evidence for Moore himself torturing um, Protestants is slim at best and, and possibly, um, possibly non-existent. Um, at the same time, Moore certainly was viciously opposed, well, vicious, that's, that's, too, that's the wrong word, vehemently, shall we say, opposed to heretics, um, and I don't think had any qualms about their torture um, or execution, whether he himself participated in that or not. Um, and all of this really opens up um, the very biggest questions about this period in history having to do with the Protestant Reformation and whether that's seen as a good thing or a bad thing. Obviously, if you're a Catholic, um, it's not a good thing. Um, if you're a Protestant, it is. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, it seems to me the very best of historians are able to put those sorts of um, polemical positions to one side and examine the history in its own rights. But, but these issues do come up and bubble up uh, in the context of discussing Mantel's novel. The other big question, um, and I realize that we can come back to lots of the historical arguments, but the other big question, it's, it seems to me, is what exactly is a historical novel? Um, it's an odd sort of beast. Uh, it tends to get lumped in with various other uh, types of novels that are called genre novels or genre fiction, you know, so you have sci-fi and fantasy and young, young adult and whatever else you want to call it. Historical novels are not serious fiction, although there are some examples and have been for some time. I mean, the novels of Walter Scott are part of the um, traditional literary canon, uh, and there are other historical novels that, that have been um, 
revered or admired. Um, Charles Dickens, for instance, his novel, um, Tale of Two Cities, is set during the French Revolution. His principal characters are fictional, but it takes place during real time and the history is part of it. So what is a historical novel and, and what is historical fiction? You might almost think that it's a kind of oxymoron, that the two terms are in fact uh, directly opposed to and contradictory of each other. I don't think that's true though, um, the more we think about it. For one thing, in the period I spend most of my time studying, which is in fact the period that Mantel's writing about, the 16th and 17th century, the word history hasn't yet fully diverged from the word story. So even though there are historians who are writing history as we would recognize the term, history can also mean simply story, the tale of something or other. And so history does in fact have a relationship to the kinds of tales or stories that are told in works of narrative fiction. And even when you're writing history properly speaking, we may not recognize it all the time, but historians are constantly making things up. And that's of course what fiction means from you know, the Latin word to, to, to make, um, facere. In order to create a coherent narrative out of all the bits and bobs of evidence and data that historians discover, you have to create something, you have to develop character, you have to elaborate words, you have to set scenes, you have to fill in all sorts of blanks that make the historical narrative more coherent than simply a table of statistics. Um, so that there is in the writing of history, a strong element of fiction. On the other hand, novels, even non-historical novels, whatever that is, it's not really a term, um, are packed full of history, um, at least in the sense that they're based on reality, real stuff. You know, you, it's, I mean, of course, if you get into the realm of fantasy and science fiction, you depart from that a little bit, but not entirely. Otherwise, novels wouldn't be comprehensible. A novelist roots whatever story is being told in some kind of a real world that we can recognize. And often that real world is full of actual historical data or stuff. Think about um, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, for instance, right? He, you know, he has to know something about Nantucket. He has to know an enormous amount about whales and the whaling industry and sailing and seafaring. So that there is in fact quite a lot of history in his novel, even though nobody would call it a historical novel. Um, but then we have these, these things that are called historical novels. And you know, what, is, what exactly does it mean? I don't, um, I mean, there's a greater proportion of history. Is that what we mean? Um, is it a question of where the fictionalizing occurs? You know, I mentioned Tale of Two Cities. The principal characters in that Dickens makes up. It's set during the French Revolution, but it's fictional characters in that world. Is a historical novel one where, like Hilary Mantel, she's actually using historical figures as her main agents? I don't know whether that's, whether that's key. Um, it is true, though, that, that historical fiction is not a new genre, as I said. It goes back even to the Renaissance. I mean, if you know Shakespeare's plays, a good chunk of them are history plays. And that was a very popular genre, especially in the 1580s, 1590s, but later on too. So he writes plays about the Wars of the Roses and about King John. He writes plays about um, Roman history, like Antony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar. Um, and those were very popular on the Renaissance stage. He's drawing on historical material, but he manipulates it in various ways. And maybe, and that's probably something we'll end up talking about, um, that manipulation. Um, is it accurate? Does it need to be accurate? What do we do if it's not accurate? I was thinking too, though, that even apart from plays and novels, like Booker Prize winning novels, we watch a lot of movies and television shows that are essentially historical. You know, you think of Steven Spielberg's Lincoln or films about um, various sort of major issues in American history like Selma um, or the, the popular TV series about the recent monarchy in Britain, The Crown and various other films about um, more recent British monarchs, or even something like, you know, something you wouldn't necessarily think of as a historical film, film but Bohemian Rhapsody, right, about, about that popular band. Um, it's a historical film. Um, and yet, you know, so it's, it's a work of fiction, but it's based on history in the same way that 
Hilary Mantel's novel is. Um, just a few more questions, and I realize I'm taking up too much time, but um, I was rooting around trying to see what people had written about historical fiction, and it turns out not very much, which is interesting. I found a lot of things, a lot of um, articles and, and uh, pieces written about the value of historical fiction in teaching. So that uh, it seems as if some people think that historical novels are a great way to introduce, especially younger students, to history, sort of like the spoonful of sugar approach. Um, although there, I don't know. I mean, is, is that a really good idea? Um, certainly, that's not really what Wolf Hall is all about, since it has a, a very large, active, interested adult readership. And I don't think people are going to these books in order to learn the history. Um, they're going to, to them because they're powerful novels, even though they're about history. And I should say that, that at least a couple of the best reviewers of the novel that I found, um, one of them, Dermot McCulloch, who's another great um, historian of the period, who's written um, a major, actually since Mantell's Wolf Hall was produced, he's published uh, a massive biography of Thomas Cromwell, arguing that in fact, Cromwell really was rather closer to Hilary Mantel's version than people had thought. And then also the New Yorker critic, James Wood, both of them argue that, um, that really Mantel's novels are best thought of not so much as historical fiction, but as fiction, possibly great fiction or successful fiction that happens to use as its primary material history and historical characters. I don't know whether that's a distinction that's useful or that we'll, we'll agree on, but at any rate, I, that should be enough to, to hopefully generate some further questions, and I'm interested to hear what you all have to, to say. Thank you so much, Hannibal. Yes, uh, that's a great start to the conversation here. Um, again, everyone, feel free to submit your, your questions or comments. Uh, you can use the Q&A if you want to type, or you can click raise hand if you'd like to speak. Um, our first question is from Nancy, and she asked, why is it called Wolf Hall? None of the action takes place there. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, in, in it, I suppose it partly depends whether you're thinking about this novel in itself or thinking of the series as a whole. I mean, Wolf Hall serves as a kind of teaser at the end of this first novel, giving you a sense of like what's coming next, you know, and 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 we have also Jane Seymour, who's sort of lurking around. She's an innocent character, but we know the history. This is, I think this is an interesting feature of the historical novel. And it's also certainly something that Shakespeare does in his history plays. You know, if you know that a good chunk of your audience already know the history, then you can kind of play with that and exploit that. So, you know, you have a character like Jane Seymour who comes on and doesn't really do much in this novel, but you know she's big later on and you know what's coming. Um, why Wolf Hall beyond that? Um, I mean, it's in some ways, I mean, I, we're sort of reaching beyond this novel to the rest of the series. I mean, Wolf Hall and the Seymours is, uh, is, when we reach that point in the history, that's sort of where um, Cromwell's career begins to unravel. Um, so in some ways, um, in some ways that sort of looks forward, not just to um, the rise of Jane Seymour, but to the decline of Cromwell. I also happen to, I, one of the, I mentioned various, um, um, I, I feel guilty calling them Catholic articles, but you know, I mean, it, they're by professedly Catholic writers in the Catholic journal, First Things. Uh, and one of, one of these that I was reading was, was arguing for a kind of psychoanalytic um, reading of Hilary Mantel. Um, this was one also that called her basically a heretic and a blasphemer, but but um, was trying to, to say that um, there were aspects of Wolf Hall that sort of aligned with Hilary Mantel's only own story. Um, I guess she comes from a sort of troubled background and uh, her father left her and her mother took up with another man. And anyway, I, I, <laughs> I really don't wanna get into that too much, but it, it might, who knows? I mean, if you, if you subscribe to that kind of psycho, psychological reading, uh, maybe there's something in that, but it is, it's a good question, you know. Um. Absolutely. Uh, so one question you touched on a little bit earlier, um, uh, but question we received in advance was, would Thomas Cromwell be considered one of the most successful, perhaps influential statesmen, along with Cicero, for example? Another great question. Um, and uh, I should say, I mean, I, this is, this is Dermot McCulloch's book, which, you know, if you're at all interested, uh, in Cromwell, 
I mean, he's a brilliant historian. I don't know how he manages. He seems to produce one of these doorstops of a book every few years. But this is, this is now, I think, without question, the definitive biography of Thomas Cromwell. And he is really arguing that he was one of the most important figures in English history. I don't think the comparison with, with Cicero is necessarily a good one. I'm not an expert on Cicero, but I mean, we think of Cicero as, as one of the great statesmen and we think of him as a kind of, well, I mean, he was during the whole Renaissance period, the model for Latin style. You know, if you were, if you were a schoolboy um, and wanted to learn Latin, what you were taught was Ciceronian Latin uh, because he was considered such a powerful, great orator. Um, that's not Cromwell. I mean, Cromwell is, is a statesman in a different kind of way. Um, and I think, I'm, I think that's what, what Dermot would argue that, you know, his, his greatness is, is of a different kind. He's not somebody who makes speeches. He's not a public, he, he's not in some ways even really a public figure. He's behind the scenes. He's a bureaucrat. He's a calculator. He's a numbers man. And, and that I think is, is where his enormous strength lies, that he basically revolutionizes the, the government of the United Kingdom, or well, what at that point is is at best Great Britain. Um, but that before that, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a relatively, from a modern perspective, a relatively primitive system, right? Parliament hasn't quite gotten even into its own. Um, any kind of major expense, certainly, I mean, the major expenses that always crops up is war. Um, any war requires an enormous amount of money, which always causes problems because there isn't a lot of money. There isn't a standing army. Um, Henry, of course, as a king, spends an enormous amount of money himself, which is a problem. And in a way, Cromwell's most important revolution is financial, that he just he systematizes the bureaucracy um, behind the monarchy, behind the aristocracy. He, he makes it pay. Um, in all sorts of ways that, that you know, we might think of as unpleasant, right? I mean, he, he doesn't begin this, but he, he certainly um, uh, charges ahead with dissolving all of the monasteries in England. Um, I mean, the monasteries are in a sense redundant after the Reformation anyway, because um, the orders that they, uh, they're supported by are dissolved. So that um, you know, the, the various orders like Dominicans and Franciscans and Carthusians um, are kicked out of England, and so the monarchies don't have a function anymore. But a lot of them have an enormous amount of money um, connected with them um, and property. And Cromwell sort of breaks that into the um, into the state, into the royal coffers, um, and that's partly um, what pays for it. But he's also, I mean, he's not just he's not just sort of like gathering cash. He's systematizing. He's structuring. He's making sure that there are systems in place. And so that's that's the kind of um, the kind of politician he is. He's, it's really sort of structural, financial, um, bureaucratic, um, which I think, I mean, as I say, I'm not an expert on Roman history, but my sense is that, that Cicero's uh, greatness, whatever it is, is of a different sort, um, that, that, that he's more of the sort of statesman and orator um, than Cromwell. Susan said, uh, Cromwell was a policy wonk. Is that a fair description? Uh, that's an interesting question. Well, I, maybe, maybe in a certain way. Um, I mean, if you could somehow combine a policy wonk with a little bit of that, you know, what Greenblatt calls the sort of, you know, head of secret police. I mean, there, Cromwell also, I mean, my sense of him is that there is something, you know, ruthlessly pragmatic about Cromwell. So he's not the sort of person who's fussing around with abstract ideas. For him, it's very much on the ground, boots on the ground. Um, he is very much interested in policy, but not abstractly. It's all practical and, and, and tends to involve particular people too. I mean, that's, that's obviously another part of his gifts is that he's able to, to figure people out um, right across the, right up and down the social scale, judge their strengths and their weaknesses and put them to use in ways that are appropriate to both of those. I, I was so interested while reading this, I think I uh, was sort of trying to figure out what Mantle's doing and sort of where, where she's getting us to sympathize. And I was really struck by just Cromwell's competence that I was like, I'm rooting for this guy because he's really competent and clever and he understands how to play this game. 
Um, it's, it's true. And, and uh, you know, he's surprising, I think, you know, even whatever you think of him, he's an unusual character. I mean, he does, it's true what she says. I mean, he comes out of nowhere, you know, like he's, he's born on the, on the wharfs in Putney. I mean, his father doesn't, it doesn't seem as if his father was quite a, quite as much a brute as, as Mantell makes out, but, you know, he comes from that, that quarter, you know, he's like a street kid. Um, and then he ends up, you know, he ends up in, in Europe, not doing some kind of aristocratic grand tour, but working as a soldier, you know, I mean, he's, he's like punching his way around, learning how to fight, learning how to scrap and stay alive. And then he somehow works his way into the banking system, which is just developing in this period, you know, international banking with these major Italian houses. Um, and, and he, so he, and he, and he's, so he's, he's got all these, this weird set of skills, you know, <laughs> thinking of that sort of silly movie with Liam Neeson, you know, I have a particular set of skills. I mean, he has all the skills. He can, he can fight, he can scrap, he can, he can calculate. Um, he, he has this amazing memory. Um, he's, he's gifted in languages. I mean, he obviously, that's another thing about his trips in Europe. I mean, he knows all of the European languages as well as um, classical languages. Certainly he knows Latin, um, which you have to know in, in order to, um, to deal internationally. Um, uh, and, and, and also, I mean, he's, he's somebody who's, who seems to have a genuine interest in the sort of religious ferment at the time. I mean, it's not incidental for him. He's got a real commitment um, uh, to, to Protestantism, to what it becomes sort of uh, English Protestantism. So along those lines, we have a question from Susan. Um, so it was interesting to me that there was so much going on in England and Europe that impacted the story of, of Henry VIII becoming head of the Church of England, uh, such as Tyndale and his translation of the Bible to English. Uh, why was that such a threat? Well, I mean, that's an interesting story. I mean, and, and it's, a, it's, um, it's a peculiar thing because England, the vernacular Bible is something that is, um, I mean, it's, it's, an issue, it's, it's something that happens all over Europe. I mean, um, you know, during, um, but, but it has a peculiar history in England for one reason, and that is because in the, um, back in the uh, 14th century, um, during the age of Geoffrey Chaucer, um, a churchman named John Wycliffe uh, had a number of radical reforming ideas. Some of them were, were religious, theological. Some of them had to do with the organization of the church. Some of them were political. Um, and a number of them were actually uh, in some ways kind of prescient or at least sort of foreshadowed the ideas that 16th century Protestant reformers would have. One of Wycliffe's strong beliefs was that the Bible should be available to everybody in English or in the language that they could speak and read it in. And so Wycliffeites and his Wycliffe and his followers, whatever else they were up to, were translating the Bible and circulating copies of the English Bible in manuscript. Because of Wycliffe's other radical ideas, the translation of the Bible became associated with radicalism. And so um, after, just shortly after his death, um, the translation of the Bible was declared not just um, you know, illegal, but heretical. Uh, and and that, was un, that was unique across Europe. I know nowhere else in Europe was it, was it considered a crime or a sin to translate the Bible. Um, church authorities, you know, in some places or another frowned on them, sometimes they didn't. But in England, weirdly, at the beginning of the 16th century, it was still, it was still not just a, a crime, but heretical to translate the Bible without authorization. And so when William Tyndale decides that he's going to set to this, and he's following in the footsteps of Martin Luther, who he was reading, he is doing something really very radical and dangerous. He tried to get permission for it um, in England, but he ends up um, having to sort of flee to the continent and do his translating in the Netherlands. Um, and eventually, um, he's caught there and executed for heresy. Um, but it is, it's a strange sort of thing. And, and it's also deeply, there, there's a kind of tragic irony about, uh, especially about Tyndale, because only a few years after Tyndale is executed in 1536, Henry VIII authorizes the English translation of the Bible. So, you know, if he'd, if he'd managed to hide out for just a few more years, he would have perhaps had a long and happy life. Um, 
because his translations then get incorporated into the Bibles that Henry authorizes. And as a lot of scholars have pointed out, a good deal of what becomes spread all over everywhere in the English speaking world in the King James Bible is the work of Herman Pinville, um, who died for it. So Susan said, uh, I was surprised by all the humor that Mantel puts into the book. Does that make the dry parts more digestible? I suppose we'd have to sort of pin down what you think of the dry parts. Um, uh, and and see, I, I mean, I think for my money, I think that's that's the, the gift that, well, I don't use the word gift, but I mean, what, what Mantell really achieves more than any of, I mean, as I said, you know, there are tons of different fictionalized versions of, of Tudor history, you know, from, you know, including the sort of silly kind of soft porn Tudors show that um, um, was running for a while and is sort of spun into various other things like there's a, isn't there a, like a, there's a, a Mary Queen of Scots film or anyway. Um, uh, Mantell really makes this world come alive. And I think part of that is humor, sure, that, that she, you know, she takes these characters. This is partly what I was saying in terms of, um, you know, trying to bring history alive. Even historians do this, right? I mean, you, there are things we know about Cromwell, about Henry VIII, about, you know, all of these other characters, but there's an enormous amount we don't know, but that surely existed. Like, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that many of these people had a sense of humor or that they, they had certain appetites or things that they enjoyed or certain, you know, uh, um, unusual pleasures or hobbies or what have you. And, and by, by sort of rounding these characters, I think Hilary Mantel takes us into the narrative in a way that we might not you know, be drawn into in a, in a more straightforward history. Um, I think that the humor is certainly part of it. Um, although humor is, the humor is, it's a strange world um, you know, from a, from a you know, 21st century American perspective. I mean, part of, I think, what Greenblatt is getting at when he likens Cromwell to Berea is that it is a totalitarian state. I mean, Henry VIII is actually in control of England to a much more, you know, absolute, in a much more absolute sense than Stalin was in control of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, his word is law. He can execute people left and right as he chooses. Um, and it's a dangerous world and, and a world in which um, the political and the personal are sort of weirdly intertwined. So, you know, you have relationships with these people at court and you go hunting with them and you dance with them and you sing songs with them and you laugh with them, um, but it's all political too. So that the person you're sort of chuckling with at one moment may be the person who turns you in the next and is responsible for you ending up in the tower. Um, so it's, there's, I, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I don't know if I'm breaking Clara's rules here, but it's, there's a sort of naughty story about Henry VIII that um, uh, I remember hearing at a, a conference once that um, when, when Henry and his entourage entered a room at court at one point, um, a courtier, a, a more minor courtier let out an enormous fart. Um, and there's this pause where like, you know, your life is, you know, flashing before your eyes and this quick thinking courtier turned to Henry and said, your majesty, I was simply trumpeting your arrival. Um, and Henry apparently got the joke and laughed and all was well, but it's like, you know, you're just teetering on the brink there. <laughs> and what, what becomes a sort of hilarious joke could just as easily have become, there, there's an, um, later in the 16th century, uh, another actually far more powerful person, the Earl of Oxford, um, had a similar embarrassing moment in front of Queen Elizabeth, and he was banished for court, from court for years. Um, uh, you know, he just became suddenly a persona non grata. So <laughs> be careful. <laughs> That's the model there. Fair enough. Um, well, again, everyone, feel free to submit uh, any, any questions or comments you'd like us to raise in the conversation. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of returning to your conversation about historical fiction, talk a little bit about the critical reception to the novels, of, you know, one man Booker Prize, but what sort of within the literary fictional world, not fictional world, but world of literary fiction and sort of critical acclaim, how is, what is the reputation of historical fiction and um, that's, I mean, it's a great question. I'm, I'm a little out of my depth here because, you know, I, my, my 
I mean, even, even though the history that she's writing about is very much in my, my period, um, I spend most of my time researching Renaissance literature, but you know, I've been reading around about this and, and my sense is that, that um, not a lot has been written, but that some scholars have been interested in what they see as a kind of revival of historical fiction in the 21st century. That you know, if you think about modernist literature from the beginning of the 20th century and, and what dominates then through into the middle, you know, popular novels in America and Britain and elsewhere, um, there's you know what what gets celebrated by you know academics and critics and prizes is not primarily historical novels, but now you have Hilary Mantel who you know twice in a row gets the Booker Prize for, for and clearly historical novels. And then there are tons of other historical novels that, that people are writing that have become very popular. And that's an interesting, you know, it's a question I don't have a ready answer to. I don't know why uh, there, there might be a sort of return to history. I mean, does it have something to do with, I mean, it must have something to do with our own times. Is it, is it does history fulfill a certain need? Is there a sense of sort of, is there an element of, I mean, especially since history, I mean, this history goes back 400 years, is there a kind of nostalgia? Um, <laughs> it's hard to imagine a sort of nostalgia for a time when, you know, people get executed for um, all sorts of things, but, but maybe, I don't know. Um, what is it, you know, I'd be interested, you know, many of you probably, you know, I assume that, that you're, you're tuning into this because you read and enjoyed this novel. And you know, why? Why, why is it that you found a historical novel of particular interest. Um, and I suppose it depends too on the nature of the history. Maybe you're not a historical novel fan, but you just like this historical novel um, more than others, which is, which is sort of what those critics I was citing were, were mentioning, right? That they were saying that, you know, it's not as if all historical novels are great, but what you have with Hilary Mantel are great novels that happen to also be historical novels. So, you know, interesting thing. Great, yeah, everyone feel free to share your thoughts. Um, Susan asked, are the other two books in the trilogy as good as Wolf Hall? <laughs> I think people disagree um, about this, you know, and that's, that's fine. Um, I, th I, th I, I mean, my own sense, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time sort of doing like thumbs up or down or rankings of things, but my own sense is that the second novel sort of dips a little bit maybe, but that the third one ends really strong. Um, but uh, you know, there's such an enormous amount of material in it that um, it, it kind of sweeps you along. Um, and by the time you get to the end, uh, it really, um, there, is, there is a kind of neat, apparently, I can't remember what it, how it is. The end of the final novel takes you back to the very beginning of the first novel in a certain way that like, that it, you know, Cromwell's experience, I mean, the, the you know, the, and one of the most powerful things of the first novel is that amazing opening where, you know, you begin with like Cromwell having been like bludgeoned is down on the ground, sort of stunned, looking, <laughs> looking across the, the stones at like what his father's boots and things like that and, and try to sort out where he is and what's going on and whether he's going to die or not. Um, and the novel, in a way, the, the trilogy sort of takes you back there at the end when Cromwell is facing the block and and you know having similar sorts of thoughts, um, so it works. It you know it, she's it's 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 not a you know you sometimes get the sense with like trilogies of novels as if you know it's just economics you know they're just trying to spin it out and make lots of cash, um, get more movie rights. But I think Hilary Mantel did clearly conceive this as a three novel set when she set out for what that for what that's worth. So David said, what struck me most about the novels, but especially the first one, was Mantel's effectiveness in putting us inside the head of someone whose worldview is clearly so different from the worldview of today. Uh, so obviously we don't have any way to know whether her portrayal is accurate, but is your impression that she captured the Tudor period worldview believably? I think so, yeah. I mean, and, and I don't have to just say this myself, but, you know, I'm, um, I mentioned Dermot McCulloch, who's, who really is, you know, as, as He's one of the preeminent um, historians of this period. He's written tons of stuff about it, um, especially the sort of religious world of the Reformation. He wrote a biography of Thomas Cranmer, the archbishop who plays a big role in it. And he's now produced a, a biography of Thomas Cromwell, 
Um, and he is strongly in favor of, of Mantel's take on this and praises her, her, um, her historical research, her insights into the period and the way she sort of represents even the most everyday kinds of scenes. Um, I, think it's, I think it's very vivid. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel, you know, I've spent a lot of time reading Renaissance literature and Renaissance uh, history of the period. And there were, I don't, didn't have the sense in various points of sort of like, you know, you've had those sort of ouch moments where you, you know, and it's especially in sort of like cheesier TV or movie representations of, you know, Queen Elizabeth the first, where you just think, ah, um, that doesn't happen in Mantell. You really feel like you're in the world. Um, looking out through Cromwell's eyes, especially. I, I found that really interesting. Even if you, I mean, even if you ultimately decide that her representation of some specific aspect of Cromwell or Henry VIII or Thomas More isn't accurate, I think it's one to respect. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not sort of idle or just, just made up. It, there's, a, there's some basis for it. I was wondering if you could speak more to as well, sort of um, the way Mantel plots out sort of all this history and all these political things that are happening onto the structure of a novel to make it sort of a cohesive piece of literature in its own right. Um, and kind of if there, if there is any sort of details that are um, diminished or, or maybe exaggerated to, to fit onto the structure of the novel, or if you could speak to that. No, that's a really interesting question. And I, and I, I, I you know, I. I think you could do this in more detail. I haven't, you know, I haven't sat down and sort of mapped this out, but, but in rereading it, you know, I was noticing, for instance, how she gets into the history that, you know, we begin, I mean, she takes us, for instance, um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, I guess, the analogy to Shakespeare's history plays. Famously in his plays about the Wars of the Roses, he, has, he represents different worlds so that you move back and forth from the world of the court, which is the world of sort of politics and, and power and, and what we would really call history proper. That's what you read in the history books. He moves from that world to the world of the taverns and the streets and these sort of low life characters who aren't part of the historical record, but who give us a, a really valuable sort of alternate perspective on life, right? I mean, they're, they're in fact the, the people who make up the, the majority of mankind, right? I mean, most of us don't make it into history books. Um, you read about Henry VIII and Cromwell and, and Thomas More, but like the majority of English people are just trying to get on with their lives. And I think Mantell does a good job of sort of similarly like moving us into the court and we have, you know, major political issues or discussions between, between the major players that we recognize as connecting to sort of the big events. But then we go back to, to smaller things and we have, you know, Cromwell sort of dealing with issues of his family or or you know, ordinary people who don't make it into the history books, but who obviously Cromwell cares about. That's something actually that um, Dermot McCulloch um, supports. He says that one, one documentable quality of Cromwell is that he remembered everybody and he was loyal to people. So he's loyal obviously to, um, uh, to Cardinal Wolsey, Who's his, you know, his first great um, sort of boss, mentor, supporter? But he's loyal to little people too. So you know, he if he has a relationship with some small person, you know, the, the, he has a relationship with the jailer um, at, at, in, the, in the tower, you know, at the end, you know, and he remembers these people and he does favors for them and he looks out for them. And later in life, you know, they'll, you know, he hasn't heard from them for decades, but they'll send him a letter saying, you know, I'm in dire straits and I need X, and he'll send the money or arrange for something like that. Um, and a, a lot of that sort of little stuff, I think, makes a huge difference. And, and, and that's, I think, part of, that's got to be part of the way she structures the book, that she's sort of moving us sort of in and out of the sort of big historical world. She also, she also I mean, this is, this is how narrative works, right? That you, one of the thing, one of the techniques for, for making a story interesting is not telling it sort of linearly. So, you know, she plunges us into something and then takes us back. Um, and um, we begin, for instance, um, already at the point where Henry is clearly about to move on or moving on from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. So anything about that, their first marriage and how that happened and you know, Catherine and her background has to be told sort of in retrospect and catching us up. 
Um, and similarly with, um, with Cromwell too, we get sort of bits and pieces of his story. You know, we start out with him as a kid sort of beaten up on the ground. Um, at various points, we get those other parts of his life story filled in, but not in a linear, not in a linear way. You know, we sort of, we jump to him with Wolsey and then we only find out later on about what happened when he was on the continent and how did he get the various sort of skills and knowledge that he got. Um, so I think she, she keeps us moving in interesting ways. And she's got such an enormous cast of characters too that she can kind of shift around, you know, that, that um, you know, we spend time with, with the court ladies, for instance, or with the queen and her entourage. But then we've got Thomas More and we've got the various sort of churchmen and the, the, uh, the main figures of state and Henry's Privy Council, um, hunting expeditions. Um, one of the, I think one of the elements I love in the novels is this re weird relationship that Cromwell has with the emperor's ambassador, Chapuy. You know, that even though officially, you know, it's a total failure. I mean, Cromwell has no interest in, in kowtowing to the emperor and Chapuy is, is frustrated by almost everything that goes on. They sort of bond together. And so they share these meals and they like send food and drink back and forth. And they, they chat sort of into the night about, you know, about, what's going on. Um, that's very cool. I like, I like that, you know, it's, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting, again, an interesting way of sort of humanizing the history. And kind of along those lines, do you think Thomas More has to be portrayed the way he is in order for Cromwell's sort of competence and character to be portrayed the way it is? Well, maybe. I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, is it a sort of like, are they sort of, it's like sort of two buckets, you know, one goes up, one goes down. Um, maybe. I mean, I think one of the things probably that, I mean, I don't know if she's, she was sort of consciously doing this, but, but in some of the earlier historical representations of this period, Thomas More is, is represented as like, you know, Superman. Um, there's a famous um, play by, by Robert Bolt called A Man for All Seasons that then got turned into a film with, um, oh, who was in it? Robert Shaw played King Henry the I'm trying to remember who played. Paul Schofield, my, my, <laughs> my wife and, and sort of database is reminding me over there. Um, but, you know, that film, you come away thinking like Thomas More is just like the greatest man who's ever lived. And, and you know, that England like went to pot and the Reformation was just a horrible thing. Henry trying to sort of wreak his, his, his will on the, on the English people and shattering the church and only more stands up and heroically dies. I think it's worth swinging the pendulum back a little bit because, because I mean, more, um, and another, another of the things about Thomas More is that most of us know him best as the author of the Utopia, um, which he wrote sort of earlier on. Um, he coined the term Utopia and it's the first utopian sort of fiction, he he's kind of imagines this ideal society, um, this island um, out, out in the middle of the place. And, and I mean, it's a hugely influential book. A lot of people, you know, people have been reading it for centuries, but that's not by any means the only Thomas More. I mean, he was deeply into religious controversy. He wrote enormous, vicious tracts um, against Martin Luther and also, and especially um, Tyndale. Tyndale and, and More were sort of hurling um, volumes at each other for a number of years. Um, and, and more, I mean, even if I don't know enough to know whether the, the charges of him personally um, torturing heretics have any substance, but as I say, he certainly wouldn't have disapproved of it. Um, and, and that I think ought to complicate our sense of his character. I mean, if, 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 if Cromwell has his ruthless and dangerous and questionable side. Thomas More certainly does too. Um, it's a dangerous time, and these are these are not necessarily comfy, cozy guys. Uh, and so I think um, even if we might not go quite as far as Hilary Mantel, it's worth thinking about what it takes to be successful in this kind of a world. Um, you notice that I mean, most of the people who are genuinely good and innocent are just flotsam and jetsam. I mean, they're the ones who end up getting caught and burned alive, sadly. So as a scholar, how do you kind of works like Wolf Hall and all these other books and movies and TV adaptations that you discuss, sort of how does this affect the public perception of the work that you do? 
It's a great question. No, a really interesting question. And and I um, I mean, it, I guess I'm of sort of different minds. I mean, there's certainly sometimes when I gnash my teeth, you know, and I'm sure you know other other people like me do the same. You know, you see some silly movie and you you think, oh, you know, why bother? I, I mean, especially when there was a movie called um, oh, what was it called? I can't even remember it, but that's okay. I don't want to encourage you to see it. So, but it was about um, it, it was sort of following this kind of alternative authorship theory. I mean, there's this sort of weird conspiracy theory that Shakespeare didn't write his own works. And so um, uh, there was a big film of, um, that sort of explored this and you know, it drove me nuts. But um, in another way, I suppose, you know, there is, you know, if people get interested in the period enough to actually try to figure out what really went on, maybe that's a good thing. Um, and the truth is that it's, you know, it's not as, you know, as I said at the very beginning of this session, it's not as if there is one single true history of the period. So, so you know, to some extent, every represent, every telling of the story is going to have some kind of a slant. It's going to have to take some kind of a position. Shakespeare himself, you know, I teach Shakespeare's history plays. I love them, but they're not reliable as you know, historical representations. They're plays, they're exciting, they, they're dramatic, but he changes the history when he wants to. Um, sometimes it works very well for him in terms of what he can stage. Sometimes he has to, you know, change characters, change timelines. Uh, you know, this famous um, uh, in, in um, uh, Rich, is Richard III, one of the powerful characters is Queen Margaret, um, who actually was long dead by the time the action of the play starts. But you know that doesn't bother him so much. She's a great character, um, so you know it's it's a sort of give and take. I can't I can't come down too hard on the contemporary novels and films without you know it, it, at the same time as saying well Shakespeare's uh, you know he can do it he can do that but you know Hilary Mantel can't you know. Um, Mantell, I should say, by the way, you know, she she said this like a hundred times in interviews that you know she stresses again and again and again that she's not writing history; she's writing a novel. You know, she doesn't want people to. She has no sense that people are going to take this as history. She's writing a fictionalized fictionalized version. You know, take it as you will. I, the portrayal of um, Thomas More in Wolf Hall really reminded me of the portrayal of Joan of Arc. Um, in Henry the Sixth plays. Uh, Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, and and Joan of Arc. There's another figure, you know, who's who's been. I mean, there've been all sorts of like novels and plays and films. Was it like Lily Sobieski was was Joan of Arc in in one film or TV series? And and they take different tacks. I mean, Shakespeare is not terribly sympathetic because you know the English. Um, well, <laughs> I was going to say in Shakespeare's day, but it's pretty much universal. The English and the French never get along. Um, so, so by and large, the French are bad in, in Shakespeare's history plays. Um, but there are a lot of other tellings of that story where Joan is, is, is a hero, is, is one of the great, you know, is, is a saint um, as she is. So it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, it's, um, is more a good guy, is more a bad guy? Well, you know, he's probably some combination of both, like most of us. Uh, Susan said, I was impressed by all the steps it took for Henry to become head of the church and how long it took. Uh, it was so much more than Henry waking up one morning and assuming this role. I had never thought about the fact that this had never happened before. Uh, in history, Henry and Cromwell invented the role for Henry. That's interesting. No, it's true. Um, and, and they are really inventing this as they go along. Um, I suppose the other, another aspect of that is, is that, um, and this I think is is again, part of this sort of complexity of, of things. You know, for, I mean, Henry VIII was, was clearly, I have a, a, a friend and colleague who is a um, Tudor historian and she, she hates teaching Henry VIII because she just thinks he's a monster. Um, and I think she's right, you know, I mean, he is a monster. He's horrible, he's nasty, but he's also sort of weirdly compelling um, sometimes. And even kind of, even kind of, you know, there are these moments in the, in the, in the novel where it's sort of, you know, you realize he's a monster, but he's sort of somehow charming. You know, he's playing with kids or puppy dogs or singing or something. Um, but one thing that a lot of the fictional versions leave out, and I think even Mantell doesn't give you as much as, as she should or could. I mean, Henry really cared about, even if, even if he was partly trying to divorce his first wife so he could marry someone else and get an heir, 
He also genuinely cared about these religious issues. I mean, he read theology, he, he read the Bible and thought about these things so that, so that it's not as if he's, he's not purely Machiavellian, he, he cares. And so um, when he is trying, you know, I when, he's, when he's looking for a way out, he is looking for a way out. He's look, you know, he wants with Cranmer, with Cromwell, to find a legitimate way of doing what he wants to do. There have to be grounds to divorce Catherine, right? Just as there have to be grounds to condemn Anne. I mean, they're obviously a bit trumped up, but then similarly, you know, like how can we legitimately argue that, you know, England, that the king is the head of the English church? And they come up with arguments. They come up with precedents. They come up with, you know, with, with religious arguments, and then then they can use that. He doesn't. He doesn't simply say, "Okay, just do it." You know, I don't care. He does care. Um, I mean, he wants his way, but he wants his way to be a way that he feels is also persuasive, you know, reasonable. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're drawing to the the end of our hour. Hanwell, did you want to share any closing thoughts, uh, parting um, words for everyone? Well, one thing that hasn't come up, and, and I, I don't know if, I mean, obviously, there are probably a long list of questions, um, uh, given how many of us are online, but, but one of the things that a lot of people have commented on is, is Mantel's style, um, which is, uh, you know, especially her, her, her habit, I mean, she, she writes in what is known as, as free and direct discourse. So she's, she's writing in the third person rather than the first person, Thomas Cromwell isn't writing like an autobiography, but she's writing in the third person from his perspective. So in a weird way, even though she's writing in the third person, you sort of forget that sometimes, and you feel that you're kind of looking at the world through Cromwell's eyes, but she has this sort of odd way of like, she, she doesn't, she wrote about this, like, I mean, I have this comment from, from, uh, from her, from Mantel, she says, you know, the events were happening now in the present tense, unfolding as I watched. And what followed would be filtered through the main character's sensibility. He seemed to be occupying the same physical space as me with a slight ghostly overlap. It didn't make sense to call him Cromwell as if he were somewhere across the room. I called him he. So she's continually like he, he, and sometimes that gets sort of dis disturbing or confusing. Um, and sometimes she does throw in that Cromwell. So you have like he Cromwell, which sounds sort of weird, but I, but I think the ultimate effect may work. You know, it's sort of a judgment call. I mean, I don't know whether, whether you all felt that it worked, but, but I mean, what she's obviously trying for is a, a particular style that allows her to take you inside his head in an unusual way. Um, and it's, it's interesting that she, you know, I mean, she's 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 obviously you know, somebody who's very conscious of, of literary craft, and I think that's kind of intriguing. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you uh, so much, Hannibal, for sharing your time and expertise for us. A big uh, virtual round of applause from everyone. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for everyone who's able to join us this afternoon. We really appreciate your time and all your your thoughtful questions. Um, we hope you can join us next month on January 19th. We'll be discussing uh, The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. Um, again, we'll send out a recording uh, here in the next couple of weeks of this event. Uh, but everyone stay safe, stay healthy, uh, and we'll see you soon. Have a good one. Take care. <laughs>